might be a Viking or a Saxon or a Roman, but tell me, do you like them? Would you sex them? Would you bone them? Would you go to bed with King Ethelred? Would you bunk William the Conqueror or romp in the sheets with Samuel Pepys? Mussolini was a meanie, led a fascist insurrection, but does he make you creamy? Does he give you an erection? Would you pork Richard the Duke of York? Does a boner start when you think of Bonaparte? Are you sexually aroused at the thought of Pol Pot? Historical hot or not? Hello and welcome to Historical Hot or Not, the podcast that is to history what erotic fan fiction is to the work of J.R.R. Tolkien, namely an obscene act of disrespect. I am Aidan McCaffrey, I am not a historian, and this is... Catherine Mather, and I am also not a historian, but we are horny for history. Uh, and today we're joined by Anuva Pell, who are, are you, are you a historian? I am not a historian, Aidan Catherine, I'm not. Uh, oh. But I, I have a, a strong desire to find out sexy people from history. It's, it's the only thing that I'm really interested in. I'm not even interested in my own, <laughs> own family or food, or income. Um, I, I, I'm just mostly interested in sexy people from the past. Oh, you are the perfect guest for this podcast. Anavab, you are a multi-hyphenate, according to Wikipedia. You are a stand-up comedian, a screenwriter, a playwright, and a novelist. Well, you know, I, these are all just different ways for me to figure out whether Queen Victoria was hot or not, or <laughs> whether... Whether Emperor Akbar the First, the greatest medieval Indian king of all time, whether he did or did not have a very active harem, you know, all these things that I've done in my hyphenated life is just just building up to this podcast, really. Yeah. Well, we're glad to hear it. (laughs) Would I bang Mahatma Gandhi? The play adapted into a book, then adapted into a film. It exists across (laughs) all media. Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) Actually, there is something I wanted to ask you, Anivab. You are currently in uh, Calcutta, uh, I believe. Now, um, we just just wanted to ask what your opinion is of a friend of the podcast, Mother Teresa. Uh, We have done uh, (laughs) we've done an episode on her, and uh, I would be interested as somebody from the area. (laughs) What's the vibe on her? Uh, Did you do her as a historical hot or not person? Yeah, she was in she was in the Baddies episode, the Baddies series. We realised she was quite hot as a young lady. Oh my god, yeah, I would. You know, I've never, I've never googled young Mother Teresa question mark. I've never have, I've, you know, it. I'd be quite a disturbed person if I did that. I think that there'd be <laughs> consequences. I, I all I remember is in my the the her view locally is a lot nicer than her view when I travel out west because oh wow, I guess people have all these views about Catholicism and conversion and how she shouldn't have done all those things. Here, you know, she's just a city celebrity who helped a lot of really, really poor people into homes and, you know, gave them shelter. So given we, India doesn't have that many Christians, you know, the percentage of people she converted didn't really affect people here that much. And sadly, by the time I went and volunteered as part of my school trip, it was a thing that a school organized where, um, different years we'd go in and volunteer at Little Sisters of Charity, which was her charity. She was uh, of considerable age. So even though I was at an age where I should be Googling, <laughs> you know, whether she was hot or not, <laughs> I didn't because I, out of reverence maybe, or out of just the institution, I did not do this. And now I think at 47, it's even creepier <laughs> to do it. Oh, it's not. You'll not regret it. Look, if you get trapped in by those monsoon floods, I'm just yes. saying on a vab, Google young Mother Teresa and you're, you're yeah. in for a treat. She is one Mediterranean beauty, that lady. Um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, I think my internet service provider, <laughs> I don't live in Russia, so it's, it's not tracked or anything, but I think this is one area where I think I'm going to get a call from my internet service <laughs> provider saying, what exactly are your romantic <laughs> and sexual interests if you're Googling li- this? You've never been on YouPorn, but you spent a lot of time looking at young pictures of nuns from the nineteen twenties. <laughs> What's going yeah. on with this search history? And the money. What is going on with those donations Speak. that was given to Mother Terry? Before we get into the main episode, there is one other link. So Anavab, you are one of the rotating co-hosts on the Bugle podcast. And there is a bit of a link conceptually between this and the Bugle, which is 
Back in the noughties, many years ago, Andy Zaltzman and John Oliver, then hosts of The Bugle, they had a section called Hotties from History, which is sort of a, like a proto-pod version of what we're doing here. Is that something that still happens in The Bugle? Do, do, does Andy, because I know he had a fixation on Florence Nightingale, didn't he? <laughs> which was sort of what sort of spawned the whole Hotties from History thing, and which I think then perhaps inspired this podcast. Uh, is that something that still comes up on the bugle, or has he moved on to other other dead uh, nurses? <laughs> so very early on uh, in the episode, he does a section called "Today in History," where something completely factually inaccurate is brought up, but it has some loose connection with an actual historical event. I think some weeks ago we did the day the cricket ball was supposed to have been invented, and also the day when the writer Hogarth wrote his first pop song. So I think some of these <laughs> I don't think are entirely accurate. As... <laughs> well, we, we have a fair amount of bullshit here on Hot Not Pod, but, uh, but there is a little bit of an educational value. Mm. We, we're not going to be making up Mother Teresa's first uh, foray into rap music or anything like that. Uh, we try and keep the history factual, but the horniness earnest. Mm-hmm. That's what we're going for on Hot Not Pod. <laughs> You guys are far more accurate because you actually focus on a historical figure and and discuss it as opposed to sort of nonsense inventions from historical (laughs) characters. Yeah, the things Andy Zaltzman makes up when he's not watching uh, hours and hours and hours of cricket. (laughs) Correct, exactly, exactly. We at Historical Hush or Not will discuss a significant person from history. We will first make a superficial assessment. Uh, We'll have a little look at the picture, objectify the heck out of them, decide whether they're hot enough for us to fuck. Then we'll find out a little bit about their personalities and make the final assessment, whether we would fuck them or not, uh, if if we would. Uh, then they end up on the bay, you'll tap that straight. Today's person that we're talking about, she is called No. She is 30 and she was born in Moscow. I just have one question for the both of you. Um, as you know, I'm a, I'm a recent visitor slash performer in the United Kingdom. I've only started visiting the UK to do shows from about 2016, 17. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have told me, Anavab, you are very familiar with British culture and you've watched a lot of TV shows and books from the UK, so you wouldn't have any cultural issues assimilating in the United Kingdom. And by and large, it's been good, except for one thing, which was a massive culture shock for me. And I say for a specific reason in the context of this podcast, I had never encountered the show Naked Attraction, (laughs) uh, because no such thing exists in this country or on the planet. (laughs) So um, the fact that you could have a thing like that and just uh, pick a partner and a romantic partner just based on just reproductive organs was quite fantastic for me. And I feel like this is somehow an intellectual version of that. Yeah. A clothed intellectual (laughs) version. (laughs) Intellectual is a very strong word. (laughs) (laughs) Of my biggest culture shock in the United Kingdom. (laughs) This is close. Andabab, are you telling me that in Narendra Modi's India, you cannot turn on the TV and see people rating sexual partners based solely on the appearance of their genitals. I am shocked. <laughs> I, shocked. I think I think that's the whole basis of Narendra Modi's government, <laughs> is in some metaphorical way, we are just being judged for nudity. I think you're absolutely correct. I thought it was in the BJP's uh, manifesto. That's all. <laughs> Compulsory nudity is written in <laughs> the most powerful political party ruling 1.5 billion people. <laughs> Just to clarify something, this picture of this lady that Katha sent, she is clothed. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> From the, she, to the listener's point of view, it may have sounded like that Katha just sent an, an image of a woman's vagina <laughs> to me and Anavab and gone, what do you think, lads? Yeah, and I have done that before, and, but uh, on, this, on this occasion, <laughs> uh, it's a whole person with clothes on and not just genitals. <laughs> but having said that, Based on the clothed image, I wouldn't mind seeing a genitals, mm. which answers the question, Kath. I think this is an attractive mm. woman. She uh, appears to be Indian. It's black and white, but she does appear to be of Indian mm-hmm. descent, I'm guessing. She's got very nice eyes. She's sort of looking quite knowingly at the camera, which might be perceived as being coquettish. Uh, I don't know when this was taken. Was this taken like in the 20s or 30s or something? I guess it'd be the 30s. Uh, but she has a fairly modern look, I reckon. I would bang this woman and I haven't even seen her vagina. <laughs> There wow. What do you reckon out of that? This, as you correctly pointed out, is a photograph, a black and white photograph of, of what looks like a Persian or Indian woman, uh, very much similar to 
a photograph I'd see in my family album. And when you'd ask, who the hell is that? And they'd say, oh, that's your aunt who ran away with that guy in Goa <laughs> and then died in Vladivostok in 1963. You know, so he said, what else can you tell me about this aunt? He said, nothing. She was non-vegetarian. You know, that's all the information. <laughs> that's the kind of photo this reminds me of, you know, and she'd have like a, a generic name that you'd get like in an 80s Western rock song, like Shanti, you know, like she'd have a name <laughs> like that. So that's that's broadly all I could tell from Catherine's photograph. You know, it's she, she's piercing eyes, very beautiful woman, but definitely did something quite adventurous for the time. You know, like ran away with a French film director, leaving behind six arranged marriages, you know, like something <laughs> that people talk about for a while. Whilst also eating dairy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're actually not far off. To be honest, this is uh, a person that I have wanted to uh, do, if you will, on this podcast since before the podcast existed. The podcast was uh, originally just going to be about women from history. And then Aidan was like, but what if we objectified them? And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> what do you want to be a co-host? <laughs> this, this is somebody I've wanted to talk about for a very long time, but she's very cool. Just from the photograph, she doesn't look like... She's up for a party. She's quite menacing and looks quite pissed off to be photographed. Well, you say that, but I, I looked at her eyes and said, coquettish. You've looked at her eyes and gone, this woman is a threat and she's angry. <laughs> so one of us, one of the two of us can't read women. And I'm very curious <laughs> to find out which one it is. I've got, a, I've got a strong suspicion it's me and I'm the one who can't read women. No, no, it's, it's definitely me. It's me. I've been, I'm 47, married 15 years. Uh, you know, I, I, I messed up the takeout after with my wife just now and received a scolding six minutes before this podcast. So it's definitely me. I, I would say that you both are. You, you are both kind of correct. And we'll see why down the line. This is No Inyat Khan. And she was born on the 1st of January 1914 in Moscow. You're giving me a nod. Do you, do you recognize this name anywhere? I know there was a film recently. All I'm going to say is that the word spy is involved somewhere. Yes. I have a soft spot for spies. I have a soft spot for 1920s. Mm -hmm. We don't get a lot of in Indian spies just generally in the world. No. <laughs> um, it'd be a long time before we get an Indian James Bond for many, many reasons. <laughs> yeah, she is so cool. I love her very much. So her father uh, was called Inyat Khan and he was an Indian Sufi Muslim teacher and musician. Her mother was an American poet called Aura Ray Baker who took the name Parani Amina Begum when she married No's father after they met when he was touring the US as a musician. No's father was a descendant of Tipu Sultan also known as the Tiger of Mysore who ruled the kingdom of Mysore in South India making her kind of royalty. Are either of you guys related to anyone cool or of note? Or... I'm not. Um... <laughs> I'm related to a couple of people. Well, one uh, was the food and beverage manager of a very famous palace in Kashmir, uh, which was the Grand Palace Hotel in Srinagar. And the not the main food and beverage manager, the assistant food and beverage manager. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who later went on to become a very famous Indian wicketkeeper. Um, oh. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm named, he, but here's the thing. He was a very famous wicketkeeper, but he never played. He was always in the reserve 11. <laughs> I was named after him, uh, his son, sorry. So my parents were in the same, this is my closest association with fame, um, is the assistant food and beverage manager who went on to become a wicketkeeper. Uh, his son and I share the same name. And the only reason I bring this up, the only reason, is that uh, many, many years ago, my parents used to keep telling me this story and I used to think it's bullshit, it's bullshit. And then many, many years ago, I was on holiday in the city of Hyderabad and there's a Tipu Sultan Museum. And I was at the Tipu Sultan Museum and the curator of the Tipu Sultan Museum is this guy who shares my name. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> who's the son of an assistant food and beverage manager <laughs> of a hotel who was once a wicket keeper. And it's funny that this comes up about fame because I asked him, you know, I was like, do you know, I got my name from you. He's an older man now. I said, I got my name from you. And he said, I said, what's your son's name? And he said, my son's name is Tipu Sultan. <laughs> <laughs> so this is somehow a full circle for some wow. reason, only in the context of this story. Yeah, that, I mean, that's beautiful. Wow. I like that. I, I like this even more now. I literally, what I have read out there is 
everything that I know about Tipu Sultan. So uh, <laughs> maybe I should uh, read a book or something, but alas, <laughs> it's tar- nah, fuck it. Internet exists, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, he, he was he was considered pretty hot. Mm. I know that the, the main sort of British empire began in India when they defeated him. Ah. So he was like the big, big guy to beat. And there was a massive battle in Sarangapatnam, which he lost after like months. There was a siege and all that. And his sword, I think his sword is in somewhere in the crown jewels. I mean, India was not a country then. It was just a bunch of kingdoms. The debate is out there. Like a lot of British historians say he was a quite mean and barbaric and all of that. But he often gets featured in the top 10 sexiest monarchs list. <laughs> Ooh, by other people like you guys, <laughs> like you guys, I guess, doing such analyses. So the word is out there. But I, I know that I did not know that this lovely lady was a direct descendant of that family. But I do know that a British general called Richard Wellesley commanded an army, defeated him. And a British general called Stevens shot him in the head. Damn. Uh, I don't know why I'm laughing about this. Uh, and <laughs> and then conquered India. But not to say Tipu Sultan was very innocent. He killed loads of people as well. So you know, They all it did. Just, it was back then. That's what they then did. It's just fucking blocks. Killing whoever. Back in the olden times. And still now, really, isn't it? If we're being honest. Putin is very much letting the man side down with this whole war. Mm-hmm. I like the way you told that story, Annabelle, because you sort of talked about him being, what was it, the assistant food manager at this place. And then you went on to say he's a wicketkeeper. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. But then he's, but his wicketkeeping is very much being an assistant wicketkeeper. <laughs> it feels like he was always destined to be the assistant, but not necessarily uh, the, the front line. Of it. You know, my name's, my name's Anavab, which, uh, you know, Indian names have some sort of meaning. And my name means absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to know why this existential blankness. You know, it's not like I'm an only child. It's not my parents, you know, hated me or anything. So why did they go with Anavab and not a different spelling? Like the word Anubhav means experience in Sanskrit. The word Anavab doesn't mean anything. It doesn't even mean washing machine in Sanskrit. It means nothing. <laughs> so I was like, what? what's the reason? And they kept saying, it's because we got it from the general manager of the hotel we were staying at. Turns out, not only was he not the general manager, he wasn't even the food and beverage manager. He was the assistant food and beverage manager. If my name is Old Irish for, and it means history perf. Ah. So that's why I'm here doing this podcast. Well earned, well earned. So Noah was the eldest of four children. The family moved to London shortly after her birth. Uh, due to the outbreak of something you might have heard of called World War One. In 1920, the family moved to France into a house just outside of Paris, where she spent most of her life. When she was 13 years old in 1927, her father died and she had to support her heartbroken mother as well as the rest of her family. Uh, her dad had chosen to return to India when he was unwell as he yearned for his motherland and died a few months later, which I think that's odd that he just fucked off. We're just like, all right, bye guys, bye, 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 <laughs> and then <laughs> just just died. But I mean, it was a different time, wasn't it? Upon leaving school, she studied child psychology at the Sorbonne and music at the Paris Conservatory. She played harp and piano. She went on to a career as a children's writer, writing stories in French and English, including 20 Jakarta Tales, which you can still buy on Amazon and other better bookshops online uh, today. In June 1940, Noor and her family left Paris for the UK due to all the Nazis. Despite the family being pacifists, her and her brother Vilya wanted to contribute to the war effort and in November 1940, Noor joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, also known as the WAF, training as a wireless (laughs) operator. In 1941, she was assigned to the Bomber Training School. However, she found herself looking for a new challenge. Would you volunteer for war? Definitely not. But I, I, I also think I also think that I, I, I divide my time between two reasonably cowardly countries. Um, <laughs> Indian people born after 1975 just spend their day watching Instagram reels, and everyone in Britain just is far more interested in sort of TikToks and finding a place to rent in London. So I, I don't know if you know I, I don't think we'd be that different from everybody else not wanting to fight. I'm not a pacifist. I think sometimes you have to fight war, but I'm also anti 
me being involved in any of these wars. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a sort of hard thing to square. I'm currently reading Homage to Catalonia, and Orwell in that book talks about how in every war up to and including that one, soldiers always got likes, just as like a matter of thing. You would end up in a trench and you and everyone would end up with lice. That's enough to tip me into pacifism, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe the idea of getting my head blown off, I can perhaps entertain the idea. I'd be brave enough to do that. But to be out there without any crotch rock cream, no. Count me out. <laughs> you don't end up with trench dick, do you? Trench dick is the worst kind of dick. <laughs> <laughs> it's not pleasant. Would you say there was a thing with Nazis, so many movies have been made about it, of like really beautiful exotic women finding themselves in really Nazi places, trying to like live Mm -hmm. a life of a spy of some kind. You know, like there's so many movies. They said, I think Josephine Baker was apparently a spy. You know, they said they'd be sort of right in the middle of some fancy European city, either as like a musician or a dancer uh, I don't know what Noor and I... They were always, down to the last lady, absolutely stunning. They were all gorgeous. Of course. They were always in enemy territory with some sort of free hand. Years later, the Germans would be like, ah, she was hiding in plain sight. It's because guys guys are so dumb. Put a pair of tits <laughs> on something, and they will literally stop you from ruling the world. The, you know, the Nazi war machine was unstoppable until some areola came into view. <laughs> it's, it's not hard to defeat men at war. I think uh, Coco Chanel, uh, she was, Behind the Bastards did a series on her, and uh, she was one of those people who the, the Nazis were like, hey, do you want to collaborate with us? And she was like, hell yeah, baby, I hate the juice. Uh, and just, <laughs> she really ran with it. She was like, do I get to keep my nice lifestyle? And they were like, yeah. And she was like, I'll do whatever you want then. Also, who was that French singer that Marion Cotillard played? Edith Piaf. Yeah, PF used to sing for Nazis. And when you watch the film about her starring uh, Marion Cotillard, it's like, here's a life in the 20s. Here's a life in the 30s. Here's a life in 1939. Oh, fast forward to 1945. Here's a life in 1945. <laughs> here's a life in the 50s. It's just like, we're not massively interested. The... the uh, the uh, PF estates uh, had some stipulations on which years we could cover, and there were six quite key years which they decided probably wouldn't be of interest to the world. Mm-hmm. So it was 1943. She was scouted to join the SRE in the France section due to her knowledge of languages. The SRE was the Special Operations Executive established in June 1940, sending operatives behind enemy lines to spy, interfere with enemy operations by blowing up train lines etc and generally cause a nuisance. MI6 did not like the SOE uh, and the two did not work together. MI6 saw the SOE as amateurs, which they kind of were, that would get in the way of existing operations, which they kind of did. The SOE's director of operations was Brigadier Colin Gubbins, of course it was, Um, and NOS direct bosses in the France section would have been Colonel Morris Buckmaster and Vera Atkins, uh, who we'll probably do an episode about one day because she's fascinating. Because she is a lady in World War Two, so therefore we have to do an episode about every lady who was in World War Two. Look, it's just my area <laughs> of special interest, Aidan. I know that we've done a lot of ladies from World War Two. <laughs> I will broaden my reach eventually. Hey, I like to do dead Catholics. We both we both have our, our peccadillos. Vera was a Romanian-born British recruitment and deployment officer and assistant to uh, Colonel Buckmaster. She was responsible for the 39 female agents in the SOE uh, in the France section. She would escort each to the airfield as they set off on their mission. She was 33 years old, formidable and not well-liked amongst her colleagues, but she did get the job done. She got the job done! <laughs> Noor eventually joined the uh, SOE as a wireless operator, uh, becoming the first woman to fulfil this role within the SOE. Up until this point, women had been used only as couriers, but there was a need for more women to take on the role of wireless operator as they would be dressed as civilians, and it was more plausible that a woman in her 20s and 30s would be living and moving around occupied France than a man of that age, because uh, they kept getting stopped, because like, why are you not fighting? And they're like, um... Because of my flat feet. (laughs) 
I really like this next bit. Noor was a fierce supporter of Indian independence and she took the interview panel aback when she told them that after the war she might go and fight against the British for India. Way! <laughs> I like that. I'll fuck up some Nazis for you, but I will let you know now, I might fuck you up once this is over. So you can make the decision yeah. there. <laughs> A hundred percent, I will be on the other side <laughs> when this is done. <laughs> this is what a lot of people forget, is that basically the entire independence movement for India started among British leftists. Like basically till the 1920s, nobody in India was interested in independence. Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi started out in South Africa. And basically, there was a society in London near Baker Street called the Theosophical Society. They were basically a bunch of spiritualists. And they started telling Indian students who used to go over to study in the UK, why don't you fight for your independence? And the Indians were like, that's a really good idea. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> but the, oh, yeah. The, the, core, the core group that did all that uh, were all English people. They were all sort of Fabians and spiritualists and leftists, and they didn't really believe in any particular God. And they were quite Marxist, a lot of them. And they were really vehemently against the idea of British imperial rule, uh, they convinced a bunch of Indian people, including what became the first Prime Minister of India. I guess in the context of Noor, a lot of the Indian independence conversation was happening in London. You know, everyone mm -hmm. in India was like, yeah, the British are here. Who's going to fight them? It's fine. I get Sundays off. It's fine. You know, it's sort of like... <laughs> It was. It wasn't as vehement. Is the fact that Indian independence was or organized by British leftists why it took them about two hundred years to achieve their objective? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. But I guess at a certain point, if you're used to something, then you might not know that it that there could be anything else. Like if you've lived your entire life under British rule, then what else is there? Sort of thing. Like I think you kind of see that and. Um, I am in no way comparing the two at all, but uh, we're under British rule currently, and it's awful. Um, <laughs> you know, you just like, I think people forget that uh, we used to be able to just go to the doctors. You know, we used to just have uh, lights on the motorway, and the roads didn't used to have massive holes in them, and there used to be food in the shops. I think people have just kind of forgotten that now and they're just like well it's just how it is it's like no no it's the tories kath are you saying that the british people under tory wool are basically a frog boiling away in a pan not realizing that mm. actually he used to exist in room temperature water and it was a nice way to live kath are you saying that what what britain really needs now is a mahatma gandhi <laughs> To come out, yes, uh, of of of, <laughs> of from Hull or Ipswich or something, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then go around saying, you know, the real question is, why is my asparagus eleven pounds? You know, like to ask the yeah. real questions. <laughs> the SOE had a toy shop spy gadgets disguised as everyday items. They had invisible ink, they had silk scarf maps, exploding fountain pens, and even a range of ex a range of exploding Buddhas that they sold to <laughs> Japanese troops. Wow. Uh, I hope that they all went off at different times. <laughs> the toy shop was located in the Natural History Museum, and Ian Fleming's creation of Q in the James Bond oh, books was inspired by this. I hope they weren't buying exploding Buddhas for their children. <laughs> Look yeah. at this lovely Buddha toy. Can't wait to give that to my son. Uh, no, that's not for sale, sir. You should perhaps give that down. <laughs> Maybe give it to your friends who are in the military. Perhaps put it on a rail line and just leave it there for good luck. <laughs> and don't give that to your son. Perhaps give that to, to, the, to the Chinese. Because it's World War II. I'm not saying that as like a general thing that I end with. So uh, Aidan opposite... McCaffrey hates Chinese people. <laughs> so... <laughs> you heard it here first, people. <laughs> the training to be deployed uh, by the SOE was quite intense. Uh, they learned how to shoot, they learned Morse code, they were trained in physical fitness and encouraged to drink in their free time so that the trainers could see what they were like as drunks. You know, and someone being like, <laughs> so the secret codes are... <laughs> they would also be monitored as they slept to see if they talked in their sleep and if they did uh, talk in their sleep, what language they spoke in uh, because they had to appear as though they were natives. So just being able to speak French wasn't enough. You needed to 
not have an accent, fluent French. <laughs> you also had to not speak English in bed while you were asleep. Well, exactly, yeah. You needed to look French. You needed your clothes had to be French. So they got people making clothes that didn't have labels in them. You needed to have French cigarettes. Just everything about you had to be French. This whole programme would raise massive Me Too questions now. So I'm going to train you how to do the job, then this evening we're going to get you all hammered, and then tonight we're just going to watch you sleep. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, are you are you guys uh, chatty drunks? <laughs> it's more like I get a bit too enthusiastic about a very, very specific thing that is of absolutely no interest to anyone else, like the significance <laughs> of new wave synth pop in, in the late 1970s, and then everyone has to listen to that for 25 minutes. It's the reason why I've never done cocaine or speed. It's like... If I'm already unbearable <laughs> when I've just been drinking a few beer Morettis, what are going to be like with loads of Charlie up my nose? You know, I get quite quiet, but I realize that's because, you know, in real life, when people are having a boring conversation, I generally get quiet. And then when something interesting comes up, like hotties in history, I get very excited. Th that just amplifies when I'm drunk. The only difference is when I'm drunk, I just say it out loud. Like I say things like, this is a boring conversation, <laughs> which I, 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 I think in life, normal life, I have a filter. That's how we know you're sober now, because you haven't said this is a boring conversation. Correct. And we're very much <laughs> I were talking about history and sexy people. My favorite thing. Yeah. If, if we were in a bar talking about indexation for tax benefits, you know, I, I think I, I would say it out loud. <laughs> That's the benefit of Diet Coke. But I, I, do, I do like being around talkative drunks who get very excited about a subject matter that they then really passionately shout about. As long as that subject matter is, would you bang Joan of Arc? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But but I you know, I'm I, I love, for example, fascist drunks or communist drunks. I love I love anybody with a strong ideology that gets pissed and then proceeds yeah. to explain it to other people as to why it's a good idea. Because they've kept a lid on that all day at the office. Yes. And then all of a sudden they get a few drinks in them yeah. and they're like, no, no, I'll tell you why the USSR was misunderstood and I'll explain it in no less than 45 minutes. It's like, no, please, please don't. You don't, you don't have to explain that to me. Yeah. Or, or when people, or when it's, <laughs> it's something bizarre you were not predicting, you know, like it's a quiet, shy guy who just turns, yes. turns around mm -hmm. and he says, you know, okay, yeah, I do think human beings as property is wrong, but hear me out. You know, like when they start with something <laughs> like that, you say, you're like, okay, I want to listen to this. This is my yeah, problem yeah, with democracy. Like when someone starts with something like that. Um, <laughs> and it's usually men, it's always men above 50. My favorite demographic are like Indian uncles, but I'm sure it's not limited to Indian uncles. It can be British uncles as well, you know. Uh, people of a certain age, who have very strong views on, say, homosexuality. And nowadays, a lot of it is around gender. And mm -hmm. it usually starts with, I have nothing, I have no problem with transsexuals. But where does it end? And those are the people I want to give <laughs> a few more drinks to because they know where they think it's going to end. And I just want to hear that. Yeah. Yes. Go on. Are they going to turn you into a dog? Is that it? Are you frightened? You're going <laughs> to wake up a cat one day. Is that <laughs> You got shit in a box. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> it's, it's always that, is it? Tomorrow, if you, you say you have a son and he comes back and says, I'm in love with this piece of furniture. Are you OK with that? I mean, is furniture the next thing? You know, like that kind of stuff. I mean, that's very good with a few drinks in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you just like, well, well, actually, Steve, all I asked was, would you like a drink? I'm going for a round. <laughs> and then you spent 40 <laughs> minutes ranting about having to fuck furniture because, because pronouns use has slightly changed. <laughs> Imagine the bar conversation in our time. I would think have increased in civility or what we'd like to consider. Imagine the conversations that Noor and Ayat Khan would have to hear, you know, surrounded by men in a in a beer hall. I think every conversation would begin with, you're right, love, or whatever <laughs> the equivalent was, and then nice breasts or something. Uh, and then they'd probably like squeeze her bum. Do you reckon that would be the case at this point? Because I feel like, are we still in a sort of slightly post-Victorian reserved thing where women aren't allowed to do anything but they're also not being treated like i don't know playthings uh in the office perhaps well i think that the first world war kind of changed that didn't it because women had to do jobs and then there's the, the the time after the first world war when they were like you're not making us go back to the kitchen that's insane 
and then now that so I think it was coming out of that um that Victorian prudishness yes. and then we said okay you don't have to go back to the kitchen you can come into work with us but we will make your life a sexual misery in the workplace for minimum the next five decades that's the trade-off you have mm-hmm. to make ladies and we were like sure <laughs> some days I wish we hadn't some days I wish I could have just married a rich man and woke up at noon <laughs> every day I showed my wife the film Far From Heaven which is about like a sort of bored housewife in the 50s but she's in like a big house and wears beautiful dresses and she turned to me and went I'm not kidding, I would like that life I, I think <laughs> I would just like making the home nice, wearing beautiful long floral dresses and, uh, and just cooking all the time mm-hmm. Sadly, I was too goddamn woke to make that dream come true for her and by too woke, I mean too poor. I definitely need her to be working as well as me. I cannot afford to fund that lifestyle for me, her, or anyone. <laughs> there were questions over sending no to France, and her brother begged her not to go. Her SOE training report said that she was not overburdened with brains, but has worked hard and shown keenness apart from some dislike of the security side of the courts. She has an unstable and temperamental personality and it is very doubtful whether she is really suited to work in the field. In the margin next to this on the report, Morris Bookmaster had written, Nonsense, we don't want them overburdened with brains. Part of the SOE training was a mock gust. <laughs> I know, bless. Uh, we're sending them to die, we don't want them to think about it. <laughs> Emotionally unstable, lacking in brains, but work, but works hard. That's you, Kath. You've just described yourself. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait. Hold on, because we've got more. Don't worry. Uh, part of the SOE training was uh, a mock Gestapo interview, uh, which her escaping officer described as almost unbearable and reported that she seemed terrified, so overwhelmed she nearly lost her voice, and that afterwards she was trembling and quite blanched. Other descriptives used about Noor in this time include childlike, she had a lack of ruse, she confesses that she would not like to have to do anything too fast. Remember that she was essentially training to be a spy here. <laughs> she, she was very feminine in character, very eager to please, very ready to adapt herself to the mood of the company, the one of the conversation, capable of strong attachments, attachments, kind-hearted, emotional, and imaginative. Please remember also, that for this next bit, she is training to be a spy. She tends to give far too much information. Came here without the foggiest idea what she was being trained for. Can run very well, but otherwise clumsy. Unsuitable for jumping, which I thought was very <laughs> funny, but actually, uh, by jumping, they meant parachuting <laughs> in. So not just just jumping. Uh, I, I, and I think my favourite descriptive here is pretty scared of weapons, but tries hard to get off. <laughs> Can you imagine if that was James Bond's description? Like, doesn't like being two-faced, scared of a gun, and can't hop. You know, <laughs> there's no way you'd be sending him in to kill Blofeld if that was on his resume. Imagine if we're comedians. Imagine if we were like, look, I'll do this comedian luck, but the one thing I refuse to do is tell jokes to 200 people in a packed comedy club on a Saturday night. As long as being a comedian does not involve that, I'm your guy. You know, I have a friend who's a film producer, and he, he's always believed that the real benefit a stand-up comedian has is not the shows because we go around repeating material. But he thinks a, a stand-up comedian can make a great spy, especially if a comedian does a lot of corporate shows. He can do like espionage <laughs> from one company to another. That could be our real value. Yes! I'll tell you what they were getting up to at the uh, NatWest Christmas Ball. And you sell that information for a six-figure sum to Barclays. Yes! <laughs> That's infinitely better than the set. Yeah. Although, to be fair, I used to work... I was an agency waitress when I first moved to London. And the amount of things that people would say in front of you, like, I was stood whilst, you know... Just stood there. My job was to stand there holding a bottle of wine, like a like an alive table, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a review of your stand up as well, wasn't it? Kat? Yeah, yeah, uh... <laughs> an alive table. But like, yeah, the just negotiations between nations going on, and you just wow. like if or between companies, and you're like, if I understood any of this, it'd be dangerous. <laughs> but I don't. And I don't give a shit, so I'm just going to look out the window at those birds. Is that how you got the job, Catherine? They're like, I'm going to sh- just read out some macroeconomic policy to you. And, and as they mm-hmm. watch it visibly glaze over, they're like, she can do this job. It's fine. 
She's not going to yeah. take anything in. It's all good. This cunt's dumb enough. She's not overburdened <laughs> with brains. <laughs> Maybe there was an analysis of Catherine similar to Noorin Ayat Khan. You know, with the, the, yeah. the... <laughs> That's why Kath connects with the subject matter so much. <laughs> she's me, but she's a Muslim in the 40s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah much more worldly than I was. So her code name was Madeline. Also, at the, at the time, people uh, were calling her Nora uh, rather than Noor. So you'll see that uh, <laughs> no- Nora Baker is how she was also known because uh, people in, in the 1940s couldn't stomach anything even slightly ethnic. <laughs> no, no, I can't say no. Nora, though. Yeah, that's all right. No, Khan. No, we'll call you Nora King. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What I've loved about sort of changing names from different parts of the world is when they take an easier name and they complicate it even more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's another letter. Yeah. It's Nora, but without the A. It, <laughs> it's easy. It's much easier. Why are you adding a syllable? She had a one syllable name. She made it as easy as possible for you to get this right and you still fucked it up. It's piss, isn't it? It's such an easy name to say. <laughs> it's disrespectful, isn't it? Like if if you're allowed to call her Nora, she would introduce herself as Nora. Anyway, so uh, she was called that, she called her actual name, and then her code name was Madeleine, which is a delicious French snack as well. Um, and on the 16th of June, 1943, she was dropped behind enemy lines in Le Mans to make contact with Henri Gary, joining the Prosper circuit. So there are a few different, there was like um, cinema circuit, juggler circuit, it's just the name of uh, code names for different groups of people sending information back. Roughly a week after her arrival, the Gestapo made great headway in closing in on the resistance Resistance's underground communications network, capturing all of the top operatives, making Noah's already dangerous job an incredibly dangerous job, forcing her into hiding. Uh, please bear in mind that the average lifespan of a wireless operator in the field was six weeks. Whoa. Right, because they were uh, so they weren't in uniform. They were soldiers, you know. Uh, they, but she was a soldier, but because they were in, they were in uniform. They were just identified as a. Uh, spy and shot immediately. The equipment was bulky, so the wireless, the radio, it was the size of a small suitcase. It was heavy, it was, so it was difficult to conceal. If you were asked to open it, then there was there was no two ways about what was in there. It was a radio. However, Noah was stopped in a metro station by two German officers who said, can we have a look in the suitcase? And she was like, oh, fuck. She opened it up, they had a look in it, and they're like, what's this then? And she's like, can't you see? It's a cinematographic apparatus. Look at all the light bulbs. And and they didn't know what cinema uh, kit was. And they were embarrassed. So they're like, oh, okay then. And just let her go. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, which, yeah. Which I, she also had another quite a close shave. Uh, so she was, uh, she had to move around all the time. Uh, and, you know, if you stay on air for more than 20 minutes, then you'll get found. So she was staying in uh, an apartment block and she was uh, trying to get the, the aerial out uh, to, to do her communications. Uh, and there was a German officer that lived in the same block of flats and uh, he saw her trying to get this aerial out and she was like, oh, fuck, I'm rumbled. Uh, so she told him that she was trying to listen to the radio, which was banned, but, you know, it's kind of a cheeky I don't know I guess like pirate in a DVD everybody does it sort of thing so she told him that she was trying to listen to the radio so he helped to set up the aerial uh, out of the window into this street <laughs> is she a good spy or is it just that every time she bumps into Nazis it's like the thickest Nazi possible she bumps into I think she's just pretty and charming it's like what I was saying earlier about you flash a bit of areola at a man get away with anything you know, she just has to twiddle her hair and be like, I'm just a silly woman. I don't know how to set up this radio so I can listen to the jazz. And then the German guy, the, the, the German guy's like, fine, I'll help you set it up. Thinking he's going to exactly. get Exactly, he absolutely nailed what her accent would have been there as well. Uh, I don't know why I made her from Queens, <laughs> knowing that she was <laughs> in no way from America. But I have a limited accent range and I don't want to get cancelled. So I just uh, I made her as white as possible. Fair. Do you reckon that you could charm your way out of a situation Anubab? Well if I looked like Noor and Ayat Khan yeah but as a short fat balding Indian man I don't think I can <laughs> <laughs> even if I had video equipment 
and the Nazis caught me and I wasn't a spy, I would have been executed. So, I, you know, let alone, <laughs> let alone if I was a spy. I can guarantee that if I was on the Ukrainian front now fighting for the Ukrainians, you would about a week later see a news report that says English man shot dead after caressing own nipple in attempt to distract Russian opposition soldier. I, I, I would go in way too confident about my own sexual appeal and would definitely come back with a Russian bullet in my head. Mm-hmm. Do you like this, Mr. Rusky? <laughs> for the listeners, I am caressing my nipples for Anna Bab and Kat. Something I've literally never, ever done on this podcast before. And from the looks on their faces, never will again. No, we're all very uncomfortable. The other thing is the, the soldier could have shot himself if he had to see what I've just seen. <laughs> I mean, you, you could probably still be alive. I could win any war by just doing that to the enemy soldiers yeah. and just watch them all top themselves. Like, getting the cyanide out. <laughs> Historical hot or not. By mid-August uh, 1943, she was the last remaining radio link between London and Paris. Uh, and although she was asked to return to England, she recognised the importance of her position and refused. Unfortunately for her, the Gestapo got a description of her and she was captured in September 1943, a month before she was due to head back to England after being betrayed by, uh, I want to say Rene, because that's how I pronounce my grandma's, but I think it would be Rene because they're French. Uh, Rene Gary, sister of Henri Gary, who sold her address to the Gestapo for 100,000 francs. How much money do you reckon it would take for you to give someone up like that? <laughs> I'm a jobbing stand-up comedian. A stand-up comedian will pretty much do any gig as long as it's in the three-figure sum, even if it's only just in the three-figure sum. So what I'm saying mm-hmm. is, a hundred pounds is how much I will betray <laughs> all my principles for. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with Aiden. The point also is, I'm in Nazi Germany, and it's a hundred thousand francs from that time. So that's probably about twenty million dollars in today's money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, the record keeping back then is not strong because. You know, the I am deceitful and treacherous, but also, I mean, generally as a human being, so I'd sell out anyone. Mm-hmm. But also, equally importantly, what are we really concerned about? Whether I'd be found out as being the Indian man who betrayed Noor and Ayat Khan, the great Indian war heroine, right? So can mm-hmm. I cover my tracks? And given it's 1943, uh, we're near the end of Nazi Germany, Paris occupation is coming to an end, record keeping is weak, people are fleeing. I think not only would I sell her out for you know, that amount of money. I would also try to cover my tracks Mm -hmm. and perhaps maybe like escape when I do escape, maybe like do a documentary on her, like keep her memory alive, like be the opposite of the person that sold her out, you know, like be deceitful at another level. Like, you know, be like, I tried to help, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I couldn't. In fact, I think we should, we should make a film about her. I think we need to build a statue for her, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole time I'd be the one pocketing Mm -hmm. the money. Look, guys, we're comedians. We would betray this woman for fifty pounds plus travel expenses. That's easily. all it would take. Mm-hmm. Easily, easily, and accommodation. <laughs> Breakfast included. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she was taken to Gestapo headquarters in Paris, where she attempted uh, unsuccessfully to escape twice. On the first of October, nineteen forty-three, France section received a message from. Jacques, an agent in the juggler circuit, uh, passing on information from Sonia, who was his partner, that Madeline and two others had had a serious accident and were in hospital, which was called for captured by the German authorities. The information was not acted upon by Buckmaster. It suggested because Sonia had been locally recruited and was unknown to him. So she was French and had sort of come in from there rather than uh, being sent to France. They continued to communicate with the German operator, pretending to be no for several months, sending information to them and even agents directly to the capture and deaths. No had perhaps unwisely kept copies of her secret signals, which meant that the Nazis were able to pretend to be her fairly easily. So they had to, they would ask a question uh, that, you know, it would be like, uh, the weather is nice today. And they'll be, yes, sunny, but not too hot and that would mean you know uh, I am who I say I am. For months the Nazis were essentially just putting in orders with the British for stuff that they needed to be dropped into France so they'd be like we need uh, send us two agents uh, some grenades and a, a co- yeah and a cornetto uh, <laughs> so I think. You want anything from the shop? She's all there! There was some 
sort of suggestion of corruption as well uh, in amongst there, as there is with spies, double agents and shit. But I think, honestly, that it is incompetent. And they were just... Because there was an incident, I don't know if it was with No or if it was another spy. I think it could have been No. Uh, and she sent her message and then they sent one back saying, you forgot to ask the security question. And it, it, it was the Germans. So they knew then that everybody had a security question and you know that they, they were just ridiculously incompetent uh, at what they were doing but there we go it's unlike in a government agency to be ridiculously incompetent <laughs> at what they're doing isn't it so she was placed in solitary confinement in Forzheim prison for 10 months and considered a dangerous prisoner uh, she was subjected to regular torture and left in chains for days despite this she remained silent and never gave any information to the Gestapo on the 11th of September 1944 she and three of her female prisoners Elaine Pluman, uh, Madeleine Damamont and Yolanda Beekman were transferred to Dachau concentration camp, which was 200 miles away by train and then a further two kilometres on foot. They were allowed a window seat on the train and chatted and smoked cigarettes. They arrived on the 13th of September 1944 and were locked in separate cells. Since Noah was considered a highly dangerous prisoner, she was beaten through the night, remaining silent throughout. In the early hours of the morning of 14th of September 1944, the four were taken to the crematorium where they were shot in the back of their necks. Her last words are said to be, Liberty. What would your last words be? Mine would be something like, Dawn! <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> oh, fuck! And then, like, I don't quite get to the hard K sound. So my mm-hmm. last words are just, yeah. O-F-U dash, stop. <laughs> Or, mm-hmm. do you like the way I'm rubbing my nipple, <laughs> Mr. Nazi man? <laughs> Does this do it for you? <laughs> I've spent my whole life thinking about what my last words would be, and it, will, it won't be what I want them to be. It will just be something pathetic like, my IV drip's fallen out, please can you put it back in? Or, I can't quite reach the orange cord. It's not going to be something that covers me with dignity. No. Do, do you think yours would be a profound... Last statement, Anna. You know, I think I'd I'd want to do something petty logistics wise. So I would <laughs> shout out, I would shout out something like, "My ATM pin for my debit card is four three nine six. So they shoot me in the head and I'd be dead. And I know they tried to use it and it wouldn't work ah. because it is two three nine six. I would not have held out under torture at all. They'd have picked up a pair of pliers, not even to torture me, just to like move it across the room. And I'd be like, here's everything. I'm the same as you, Kath. As soon as I see them pick up some pliers or something or start attaching the first electrode to my to my nuts, in the, in the seconds it takes them to do that, I would have produced a map of the UK and marked on it every single military base that I knew and gone, I believe this is the information you need. <laughs> I'm an absolute coward. What I'm always surprised by is how relentless the Nazis were. So, you know, like you hear all these stories, you know, when you know you're losing the war, right? Why not just run away, just start a new life in Argentina? Hmm. A lot of these guys, you know, they, they, they made their prisoners march for miles at the end. Like they wouldn't give up, mm. you know, just like, even when they knew this is a mad idea, the whole world has encircled us. And they're going to kill us. They're Russians and Americans on both sides. Mm-hmm. Even then, they were trying to march people from Sobibor to, to Dachau to Brackenau. You know, they were still thinking. I don't know what they were thinking. They're like, we hate these people so much <laughs> that we're still going to somehow see if we can make this concentration camp work somehow <laughs> in some little corner of Poland as long as we can. Just run, for fuck's sake. I mean, she's not giving you the information. You've, tor- you've tortured her. Now you're going to take her all the way to a concentration camp, torture her even more, mm-hmm. and then shoot her. I'm like, that's a lot of dedication. It's a lot of work, isn't it? It's some cost fallacy by that point. Yes. I, it's the same thing with just the infrastructure of the Holocaust, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not easy to set up trains all across Europe no. and ship all these guys. I mean, I know they've eventually caught Adolf Eichmann and they hung him. I hope someone asked him, like, you know, like, how'd you set this up, man? I mean, we can't set this up for living people. 
So how would you set this up just to kill people? It's bad, isn't it? HS2 has been being built since I moved to London seven years ago. No, not HS2, the Elizabeth line. They've only just opened it. The war was only six years. How is that? I don't know. <laughs> As well, I think it is worth uh, noting that a lot of the Nazis were on crystal meth, and that does tend to alter a person's priorities a little. Their judgment may have been somewhat impaired. She was 30 years old when she died, uh, Nora Nyet Khan. The night that she died, her mother and brother had the same dream. Nora appeared to them in uniform, surrounded by blue light. She was happy and told them that she was free. She was posthumously awarded the Croix de Guerre, the War Cross, and the George Cross, uh, she is the first and only Muslim woman to be awarded with a statue in the UK, which is located in Gordon Square near Euston Square Station. Oh, this is a sad ending. I, Kath, I uh, Google imaged her because mm. I was quite taken by the first photo. And I found a photo of what looks like her slightly older, maybe yeah. like in her 40s. But I think it's just a trick of the light on her hair. So I genuinely thought she was going to survive. So I'm quite sad that, uh, that she hasn't. She lasted a lot longer than expected, though. I know she's having a bit of a moment or has been for the last couple of years. There's been a film, a TV series. I yeah. know there's been a couple of books about her. I've been hearing about Noor and Ayat Khan since 2017. I think there's, hmm. you know, we're having a Noor and Ayat Khan moment, I think. I think this is good. I think this is, I think the same thing that is driving Kath, I imagine, to say, let's talk about this, what this heroic woman did is, there is a desire now to find heroic women from mm. history and actually when you do look at world war ii there's, there's loads of people and loads of women who you know just did stuff like well not loads of time i don't want to undermine what she did but these stories do exist and mm-hmm. we, we're quite lucky i think that we're now existing in a culture that's celebrating it and even more importantly than that asking the question would we bang them these yeah. are important questions that need to be asked about exactly. british spies from world war ii there was um an episode about of doctor who that she was in uh, with the, one of the Jodie really? Whittaker ones. Yeah, so Jodie Whittaker did one, and um, yeah, she, she was briefly in that. It was not a very historically accurate depiction, but she she was in it. Are you saying that Noor Inyat Khan didn't meet a time-travelling scientist from the planet Gallifrey? No, she Fuck didn't, off. unfortunately. The book, I think, was called Spy Princess, and mm-hmm. then they made a film out of it called Spies Among Us or something. And like you said, I didn't know she was in Doctor Who, but brilliant. But I think really what's going to get her known among the British public is this podcast. We yes. all know Yay. it. Yay! I can see the headlines now. Stupid and horny podcast puts <laughs> Noor Inia Khan back in public consciousness. <laughs> well, that book actually, uh, Spy Princess, it's by Shrabani Basu, and uh, that was a big influence on this podcast. It was one of my main sources, and I would highly recommend anyone reads it, because uh, it has got a lot more information than I could fit into this episode here. Uh, I'll also just say the other um, sources, so that I don't get into trouble. Uh, it's got historicuk.com, uh, London dot ac dot uk i think that that is some kind of university uh one and war experience dot org so you know please don't sue us i've told everyone where i got the info from historical hot or not we'll be doing a live recording uh, at the edinburgh fringe festival that will be on the 22nd of august 2023 the year that we're in now at 12 30. i want to say am it's pm though the midday one not the midnight one it'll be part of the podcast hour and that episode will be recorded as part of the Laughing Horse at the City Cafe. There is a link to the day we are recording. Each day is a different podcast being recorded. We will only be there on the 22nd. And the ticket link in our Hot Not Pod link tree, which is available on Instagram and Twitter, has a link directly to the day we are recording. I will also be doing my Edinburgh show, my debut, Ooh, uh, at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. My show is called Scream Inside Your Heart, and it will be at the Three Sisters in the Wee Room at 12 noon, 12 midday, not midnight. And that will be on from the 3rd to the 20th of August. Noor Inia Khan was posthumously awarded for her war efforts. Mm -hmm. But will she be posthumously awarded for her hotness by being put on the biotap lattice? Yes. Yeah. Would you fuck her? We'll start guests first. Yeah, Anavab. Would you bang this hot spy chick? 
you know, I've heard a couple of episodes of your podcast. I did not know this question was coming. I should have anticipated <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> the whole point of the bloody podcast. <laughs> yeah, I realize that. Um, I don't know if in 2023 a podcast can end with a question like that to a man um, uh, about a historical figure who's not around to consent. Um, I don't think I'd have the opportunity. I... Uh, I I definitely would find her very attractive, but I have a feeling a woman who speaks so many languages and is that beautiful (laughs) and is suddenly in Paris would have many suitors, many. Whereas I could say that I would have an interest in having a fling. I don't think I'd stand a chance. (laughs) One, One thing I've learned very quickly over the years as a comedian is learn when to cut your losses and leave. It's a... It's how I feel four minutes into a set at Top Secret. And it's how I feel about Noor and Ayat Khan. Very quickly, I do have an anecdote about Shabani Basu, the lady who wrote the book Spice Princess. Oh, okay. I did meet her at a literary literary festival in Mumbai. She's written several very interesting books about historical characters that have done fascinating things for Britain. Uh, one was a book that became a film called Victoria and Abdul about Queen Victoria's oh, yeah. manservant with whom she may or may not have had an affair, this guy, this Abdul character. And then she wrote about Noor and Ayat Khan. So she has this knack of finding really, really interesting characters who have a British Indian connection. And that's sort of my bread and butter when it comes to stand-up. So I'm always interested in what other figure is there in history. So I was sitting next to her, and she was this really lovely, unassuming, very middle-class looking lady in a sari at a literary festival. And I said, you know, I said, oh, Shabani Basu, I'm a big fan. I've read all your books. Uh, What's the next thing you're working on? And she said, you know, it's another Indian character in Britain in history. I said, yeah, of course it is. But what is it? She's (laughs) like, I I can't tell you. I don't trust comedians. And after that, I fell in love with her writing even more. Yeah. When she said she didn't trust comedians. (laughs) That is fair. I don't either. I'll take that as a sort of yes. You're you're willing as long as she is, which is an unknowable. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to say yes too. I th- I think she's undoubtedly hot. She's both attractive, she's cool, and she has a cool head in a situation. Mm-hmm. Even if Kath says no, but I'm pretty sure Kath's into it as well. It does feel like Noor Iniat Khan has made it onto the bio tap letter stream. Kath, are you making this three for three? Yes, I like her. I think because uh, she was so unfit to go and do what she did and she I see a bit of myself in her training there just I don't like (laughs) guns I don't like PE I'm doing my best though I really want to try (laughs) I admire her bravery at the end you know it's like she just sort of uh was like okay well I'm going to die and I know that I can't uh, if I start talking, I won't stop. So I'm just going to be quiet and say nothing. I admire her greatly. Uh, I think she's very cool and she's very hot. And that is why uh, I, I would. There's a comic book about her as well. Oh, is there? I was Googling books and I've just spotted there's, there just seem to be some kind of graphic novel. Of course uh, there is. Called Noor Unissa Iniat Khan uh, by Sophia Ahmed. No idea if that's good, but it looks fun. Yeah. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? There's a sort of desire... Among many cultural spheres, books, films, horny podcasts mm-hmm. to celebrate this woman. So. And rightly so. Guys, all I'm saying is, yes, of course, we'd all be interested in her romantically. But if she had a priority of dating, club comedian <laughs> from the future <laughs> who've gone back to the past, we would be much lower on her, on her list of people she'd even consider. Yeah. You're not wrong, Anavab, but I can't acknowledge that because it destroys the entire premise of this podcast and I'm not willing to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just assume that whoever it is we're talking about is on board with us banging them. That's fair. It's fair. And in fairness, a lot of people that we discuss are from so long ago that we would look quite healthy and attractive to them. Yeah. Because we've eaten vegetables and meat. <laughs> just modern teeth and the mm. fact that we eat citrus fruit on a regular basis is enough to make us good potential sexual partners. Mm -hmm. That would be my pitch. I I bring vaccines and modern drainage. (laughs) That's not romantic. I don't know what is. This is called a toothbrush. (laughs) I've got fluoride in my mouth and don't have scurvy. Let's get it on. Boom. (laughs) Bit of a long episode there on the longer end. 
uh, which Kath doesn't give a shit about because she doesn't have to edit it. Yep. Uh, whereas <laughs> once you get past the hour mark, I start to lose bowel control. But uh, Anurab, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think you gelled with our vibe very well. If you ever want to come back on, you are more than welcome. You are very yeah. kind. Sorry, I rambled on for a bit. No, 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 no it's good. All good. So is there anything that you would like to plug? No, the only thing is I'm back at Edinburgh, at the Edinburgh Fringe, two weeks from the 14th to the 28th. And I'm doing a very different kind of show. I'm not doing a stand-up show uh, because basically, I mean, it's a bit like a Noor and Ayat Khan story. I'm giving up stand-up uh, <gasps> because uh, my... What? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've just been hired by the British government to spread Britishness in India. Basically, I'm spending two weeks talking about the great things Britain has given the world because <laughs> not enough is being done. And so my show is titled The Department of Britishness, <laughs> but it's it's I'm on official British government business Wow! Uh, on a salary w- with a payroll and everything. Yeah. Well, somebody think of the white men. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and, and all the greatness that they've given to the world. <laughs> I'm coming to Edinburgh as a diplomat, not mm. as a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and where will you be doing your diplomatic duties? Well, dip- depends on whether they're Noor and Ayat Khan type duties or... <laughs> That's what kind of duty. Uh, I just mean, what venue are you at? Oh, where am I doing the duty? Oh, sorry. I don't know why I read into that. It's because we've made you so horny in the purpose yeah. of recording this podcast. You can't answer any question in a non-sexual way. <laughs> That's what I mean. And, I, and you know, I'm generally quite sort of Victorian and ascetic in my habits. And, and I don't get often invited on erotic podcasts. So. <laughs> it's at the assembly, 14 to the 28th. Okay, wonderful. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for being our guest, Anavab. Spread the word, spread your legs. And remember, it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside of the coffin that counts. No one's ever said that to me at 11 o'clock at night in India. But <laughs> great, brilliant. But spread your legs. It's a weird thing to hear at 6 o'clock all <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If anything, it's more weird for us doing it at the beginning of the evening than you hearing it at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Far more. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. You have been listening to Historical Hot or Not, written and created by Aidan McCaffrey and Catherine Mather. The podcast art was by our good friend Richard Todd, and our theme music by excellent musician and also good friend David Eagle. We also have music by Ergo Bismas, less a license from the Free Music Archive. If you've enjoyed us and you'd like to donate to the cause, we would love you to do that also. You can find us at ko-fi.com forward slash hotnotpod and you can download bonus episodes of Historical Hot or Not from Acast Plus. The link is available on our link tree, linktree.com forward slash hotnotpod. Bye!